find ourselves this morning, Isaiah 55. And we'll begin our reading together in verse number one. The book of Isaiah, the 55th chapter. And we'll notice together in verse number one. The Bible says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to uh, come together and to, uh, to study this wonderful passage of Scripture. Lord, your word is, is so rich in truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us as we seek your face in this day. I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray your word would fall on good ground today, that it would spring up and grow in our hearts and in our lives, and may you be glorified. May your word be glorified in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've looked together at the suffering Savior in chapters 52 and chapter 53. We call these the servant songs. They speak of the prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus would be bruised for our iniquities. His blood would be shed for our sins. In chapter 54 of the book of Isaiah, we looked at the triumphant church The church would move forward and we see the salvation of not only Jews but also the Gentile people as the church would move forward for the cause of Christ. We see the very mission of the Lord's servant that the gospel would extend into the world. And this, of course, is the message of the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope of salvation. In Isaiah chapter 55, we're continuing this very thought. And as we open our Bible and find chapter 55, right away we are introduced to an invitation. It is an invitation to enjoy everything that God has to offer. It is the greatest invitation ever recorded. It is the greatest invitation ever given to humanity. You know, when I open my Bible and I read the book of Revelation, we read some pretty serious eschatology. I mean, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is is coming again. Do you believe that? I hope so. He's coming again. And the Bible says that he would bring upon great wrath and destruction upon this earth. Widespread wars, severe famines, deadly plagues, earthquakes, and natural disasters. And yet as we come to the close of the book of Revelation, we notice an invitation to all people. We notice an invitation to the rich and to the poor. It's an invitation to the needy. The Bible says in Revelation 22 verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It truly is an overwhelming message that this is an invitation to come to the Lord. God is saying, come to me and I will save you. Come to me and I will give you life. You see, the God of the Bible is a very inviting God. (laughs) 
a very inviting God. And the invitation that we see in the book of Isaiah 55 and Revelation chapter 22 is an invitation that still stands today. In this passage of Scripture, the prophet calls out, he says, Ho, it it means this is an important message. This is an important announcement. Listen to what I have to say. This message will change your life. It will change your life. I want us to notice, if you're taking notes with with me this morning, would you write down, number one, an invitation to the thirsty. An invitation to the thirsty. Now, the invitation, of course, is for everyone, but it's specific here to those who are thirsty. When we speak of thirst, we we think about the fact that we desire for that thirst to be quenched. If you like to play sports or maybe you've taken a long walk on a summer's day, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about when you, when you have that thirst, that, that thirst that, that needs to be quenched. And, and the only thing that hits the spot is a, a tall glass of ice water. I mean, that really just meets the need. It, it really just quenches that, that thirst. The reality is nothing else will satisfy. And the Bible says in this passage of Scripture that those who are seeking truth the satisfaction of their eternal soul. Prophetically, the Bible says here, written 700 years or so before Jesus would ever walk on this earth, the Bible says that Jesus will meet the greatest need of your heart. That Jesus is the answer to the thirst that you have in your life. The Bible says in John chapter 7, verse 37, notice the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John Jesus said in verse 37 of the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink and drink. I want us to notice that salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Now, you might think that's pretty elementary, Pastor Burns, but in this world, nothing is elementary. The Bible says in verse number one, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And look what the Bible says, And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. We know this in this passage of Scripture that the goodness of God is offered free of charge. Free of charge. The satisfaction that is found in Jesus Christ will not cost you a single dime. We know the story of the woman at the well and Jesus is speaking theology to her. And and the Lord Jesus says in John chapter 4 verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, And he would have given thee living water. The gift of God. Salvation is a gift. Listen, friend. Salvation has always been free. Always been free. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's gift cannot be purchased. It it cannot be earned. No money, the Bible says, and without price. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The prophet says, listen, you, you don't need money to feast at the table of the Lord. It is a gift. A gift. I was reading a lot about the recent fraud and scams that have been taking place in our country over COVID. Uh, they say that, that phishing, and that's not F-I-S-H-I-N-G, but P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing has been increased over COVID 220%. And, and what phishing is, is when they will send you emails, maybe you've received them, And, uh, you know, it'll ask you for information. It'll say that, you know, your e-transfer didn't go through or, you know, there's a problem with your billing. And 
And, and so you click on that link on that email and you'll go to a website and it looks, it looks like it's the real deal. And, and so you put your username and password to log in. The problem is you're not going to log in. You just send an email to these scammers and now they have all of your information. It, it really is a terrible thing. And, and, and so they steal your identity, they get your banking information and, and all of these things. And what will happen is, uh, and how you know that it's not real, is that when you click on that link, the URL at the top of your browser, instead of saying, you know, royalbank.com or rbc.com, you know, it, it's going to have like bankinginformation.in backslash rbc backslash bank backslash we are fake backslash got ya backslash you're in big trouble. You know, that that's kind of how it's going to go. And, and, and over the years, the RBC and major banks have said, uh, time and time again, that they will never send information to you. They will never ask for your email. They will never ask for your banking information uh, over the email. And yet, time and time again, we seem to fall uh, predators to this type of scam. And over COVID, when, when things are tough and people are depressed, of course, uh, this has increased over 200%. And yet, we have to remember the RBC is stating and these major banks are stating that this would never happen. This is not from us. We would never request your information. And yet, as I read the Bible and I study the Word of God, and I read about the salvation that comes from the Lord Jesus, the Bible teaches us that salvation is always free in Jesus Christ. And friend, I'm here to tell you that no matter the denomination, no matter the individual, I mean, he might be a charismatic individual, he might be a likable guy, he might be a nice guy, but if he's telling you another gospel, he's not a nice guy. The Bible says that salvation is always free in Jesus Christ. It's never by your own merit. You never have to earn it. It is always through Jesus Christ. The Bible says salvation is free without money, without cost. But notice also religion is not the answer. Religion is not the answer. Now Jesus is speaking to the religious crowd in his day in the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew. A great multitude of people have surrounded the Lord and, and they were a part of religion. They were trying to keep the law in order to be saved. And that burden of religion was upon them and Jesus addressed that very burden. He said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. So many today in our world are laboring and burdening themselves with trying to gain eternal life. The burden of religion is heavy upon their shoulders. And, and, and someone has suggested that religion is just man reaching to God, but true salvation is God reaching to man. The Bible says in verse 2 of our text in Isaiah 55, Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. There are so many people in our world today that are laboring for something that will never meet the need of their heart that will never meet their and maybe you've 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 met people maybe it's you today and, and they'll say well you know i i hope i'll go to heaven they'll, they'll say something heartbreaking oh, i hope i'm good enough maybe you've heard someone say something like this well if i if i do enough if i give enough and 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 if my good only outweighs my bad and yet the Bible makes it clear that your good will never outweigh your bad, for there is none that do with good, no, not one. And all of us have come short of the glory of God. Religion only adds more burdens for us to bear. The Bible says this in John chapter 6, verse 35. Notice the words of the Lord. He said in verse 35 of John 6, 
And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Friend, listen to me. Jesus is the true bread. He's the true bread. He is the one that, the only one that can satisfy the soul. He quenches the thirst of the weary. He provides salvation, eternal life. And the Bible says it is always free. It is always a gift. It is always in mercy and grace. And yet so many labor for that which is in bread. The true bread. They try to gain eternal life through their own merit and it doesn't satisfy them. And they go through their whole entire life hoping it's enough the burden of religion upon them. And yet, let her see, life is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in our text, verse number 3, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Jesus is life. And the Bible says all that come to Him, the Lord Jesus, enjoy eternal life. The eternal life that He provides. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking here, really, He's, he's speaking against the false prophets of the day. That's the context of Matthew chapter 7. And He says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destru destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the living bread. Jesus said to Martha in John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live. Jesus is life, and life is found in him. The Bible says in verse 3 that a new covenant will be made with those that put their faith and trust in the Lord. We are saved by grace, and God showers his grace upon our life each and every day. Where would I be today without the grace of God? Where would you be without the grace of God? Probably not in church. The reality is that God's invitation here is to the thirsty to come to Him for eternal life. And He would shower their life upon with grace. They would be His, ch his child. And He would walk with them and talk with them along life's way. We see not only an invitation to the thirsty, but number two, if you're taking notes, notice an invitation to the lost. An invitation to the lost. We, we use the expression, well, they're lost, and we speak there of they're, they're spiritually lost. And so many in our world are, are spiritually lost without hope. And the Bible says that God provides leadership to the wandering life, those who are spiritually confused. How many in our world today are spiritually confused? How many are deceived? God teaches us that the devil is a liar and though God is not the, 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 the bringer of confusion, the devil is the author of confusion. And, and the Bible says that God offers truth to those that would seek him as David provided leadership for the people of God in verse number five. And as God used David to lead uh, his people, so God offers leadership and direction to those that come to him. And so God says in this scripture, letter A, he says, we must seek the Lord. We must seek the Lord. Look what the Bible says in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This statement here is a statement of urgency. Seek the Lord while there is opportunity. Because opportunity can be taken away. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And every time salvation is presented in the Bible, it is always presented in the present tense. Now is the opportunity. Now is the time. Because you don't understand that 
that, that that opportunity could be gone. You could leave this building today and be killed in a car accident and step out in the, into eternity. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And so the Bible says, seek the Lord today. Seek the Lord now while He may be found. The opportunity to seek the Lord is for this very moment because you're not guaranteed the moment after. The Bible says, seek the Lord while He may be found and call upon Him. We see letter B, we must turn to the Lord. Verse 7, the Bible says, let the wicked forsake His way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We notice in this passage of Scripture that we are to turn to the Lord. Listen, friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, let me ask you this question. What is keeping you from turning to the Lord? What, What is keeping you from putting your faith and trust in the Lord? Is it a a life of sin? The Bible says in John 3, verse 19, Jesus taught us that this is the condemnation. The judgment is not that we are sinners, but that we have rejected the only sacrifice for our sin. This is the condemnation, Jesus said, that light has come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The Bible says to turn to the living God. And to forsake your own pathway. To forsake your own way. Because sin doesn't satisfy your soul. You know, sin is like cotton candy. You can't get enough of it. It just You throw it in your mouth and it just disappears. It's gone. And that's the life of sin that people are living. They're trying to find satisfaction in, in sin. But there's nothing there. There's, there's no substance to it. And the Bible says here to turn away from this life and turn to the one that can satisfy your soul. Maybe today you're not turning to the Lord because of an idea or a thought that is against Christ. Maybe you've grown up in a certain denomination or a certain religion and it has taught a works-based salvation and, and you don't want to forsake your childhood. You don't want to forsake that foundation that you have in your life. And yet the Bible teaches us that we are to cast down those imaginations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, it says, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. An imagination is something that you believe to be true, but isn't true at all. The Bible is always right. The Bible is what we follow. We don't follow tradition. We, we don't follow the doctrines of man. We, we, we follow the Bible. And, 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 the, and the Bible says to bring our thoughts to the obedience of Christ and to cast down those imaginations. Paul wrote to Roman believers in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 4. He said, God forbid, yet let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true. When we turn to God, verse number 7, the Bible says we'll find forgiveness. When we turn to God, we'll find the the bread of life and we'll enjoy salvation. In verse number 8, the Bible says that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. Listen, I get it. You know, we, we have within us the idea that we have to work for our salvation. I mean, when someone gives us something and And even when it's a gift, I mean, the reality is we feel that obligation that that, that we have to do something to earn it. We we have to do something. That's why they give samples at Costco, because they know that nine times out of the ten, I'm telling the truth, nine times out of the ten, someone's going to buy that product. Because when you get something for free, you feel an obligation. The Bible says that God's ways are not our ways. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts. You see, salvation can never be earned. Salvation can never never be, be worked for. It is a gift of God. We cannot buy salvation. It is provided free by the grace of Almighty God. The Bible says His thoughts are far greater than our thoughts. You see, salvation is more than just a man dying on the cross. 
The gears of eternal life are far more complex than any scheme of humanity. A just God could remain just and still be the justifier of a sinful race as God sent His only begotten Son to die in your place. He became your sin. He became, He took your place and He died for your sins so that you could have a right standing with Almighty God and it is not something you have to work for. You don't have to lift a finger. You don't have to give a tithe. You don't have to go in waters and baptism. You don't have to join a church. It is offered free in Jesus Christ. And so He says, come! And I will give you the waters of life freely. Just look and live. We see the power of God's word. Let her see in our notes. I believe the next verses provide the prophetic truth of the seed of the gospel. It is the power of the word of God that makes a difference. In verse 10, look what the Bible says. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh and bringeth forth bud. The Bible says that it may give seed to the sower. Look at this. And bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You know, rain and snow to us, they seem like inconveniences in our life. But the water cycle is in God's purpose. And and the Bible says that God provides the snow and God provides the rain to water the earth and to give the earth nutrients to bring forth the bud in verse number 10. So that the one that plants the seed will have a harvest and that harvest will bring forth bread and it will feed those that are hungry. This is the operation of the Word of God. Listen, friend, this is not just a book we hold in our hand. This is God's eternal Word. And the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The Word of God is the incorruptible seed of the Gospel. And it's sad today that so many churches have decided to replace the the, the Word of God with entertainment and to replace the Word of God with other actions. And yet it's the living Word of God that changes a life. It is the seed of the Gospel. And the Bible says that God's word will not return void. It will accomplish exactly what God sent it out to do. And that is to bring people to Christ, to feed them with the bread of life so that they would be satisfied. I say to you, never be ashamed of giving people the word of God. You say, Pastor Burns, I have a a stray son or a daughter that's away from the Lord. What do I do? You give them the Word of God. You give them the Bible. It's the incorruptible seed. It makes a difference even when you can't see it. I I mean, you plant a seed. You can't see it germinate. You can't see it do anything. You just know that all of a sudden there's a plant one day and you give them the seed of the Word of God and it makes a difference in people's lives. It knows everything about them. One skeptic who read the Bible to prove it to be untrue, after he was done reading the Bible, said, the man who wrote this book made my heart. It knew everything about me. It is the living Word of God. And so I say to you, give people the Bible today. How are you doing? Well, the Bible says, today is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah, but it's snowing out. (laughs) Oh, it has a purpose. (laughs) It's raining. It has a purpose. (laughs) The Bible is the seed of the gospel. And the invitation is to the thirsty. The invitation is to the lost. But lastly, and I'll be done this morning, it's an invitation to the weary. The Bible says in verse number 12 of our text, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. 
The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. God will bring life to those that come to Him free. Those who receive His grace. Joy will be the theme of their heart, and peace will be the anthem of their soul. And even creation itself will join in the song of redemption. In verse number 12, the mountains will break out singing, the trees will, will clap their hands, and Isaiah in this, in this poetic stance is teaching us the greatness and the joy and the rejoicing in eternal life that you were a lost lamb, that you were in your sin, unsavable, and Jesus came and died as you and for you. And now you can be right with God. And now you can have eternal life. And now you don't have to wonder, I hope so, if I've done enough good. The reality is you've done nothing to save you. It's by the grace of God, and therefore you can do nothing to keep you. It is by the grace of God, and you're just trusting in the covenant of God and in the promises of God, knowing that it is impossible for God to lie. And if God says he will, he will. You can bank on it, because God always keeps his promise. And the Bible says he will save even to the uttermost. For whosoever shall call, upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That's a promise of God. We see the gift of eternal life brings restoration. Letter A in our notes, there is restoration. We notice the illustration that's presented in verse 13. The Bible says, instead of of thorns, that there will be a fir tree. Instead of briars, there'll be a myrtle tree. And when we think of thorns, we think of the curse in the Garden of Eden. The result of sin, that this This earth became cursed because of the decision of one man, and yet we find the restoration in the second Adam, in Jesus Christ. As the Scripture here depicts the restoration found in our salvation, that God would take away the barren, and and God would take away the cursed, and He would bring beauty, and he He would bring bounty once again. But then we also notice the glorification. And this is the most important part of all of it. The Bible says, and it shall be to the name of the Lord. Because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Him. And it's always been about Him. The name of Jesus is exalted for the salvation that He provides for all people. All glory to God who saved us. The Bible says that the work of God will not be cut off. Oh, the devil has tried to stop the redemptive plan of God throughout the ages. But the work of God remains. And God is still in the saving business for all people to come to Him. And so the question to conclude is simple. Are you born again today? I didn't say, are you a part of a denomination or I go to so-and-so church or I've been baptized or I'm a good person. I asked you if you were born again. Has there been a time in your life when you've called out to God to save you? Have you asked Him to be your Savior? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm not telling you to pay anything. I'm not telling you to keep up a certain standard. I'm saying today to come in faith believing that Jesus died and that He was buried and that He rose again on the third day and to place your eternal soul in His hand. That's a Bible salvation today. And the Bible says, if you ask the Lord to save you, I'm here to tell you not on the basis of Kitchener Baptist Church, I'm here to tell you on the basis of the Word of God, He will not cast you out. He'll save you. He'll save you. What a wonderful gift that's offered to us today. But there's a warning. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Because you don't know what tomorrow holds. 
and you don't know if that opportunity will be taken away. Today's the day of salvation, the Bible says. Today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word.